Welcome, oh, welcome to Conscious Embodiment Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox, coming at you for July 3rd through 9th, and we're in July, officially in July. So this is going to be a really interesting month, kids. We're in the first half of the month, and it's, it's, it's quiet, relatively speaking, but we are also in Venus's retrograde shadow, and at the end of the month, in the third week of the month, she'll turn around, so we are starting her retrograde in the last little bits of the month. There's an enormous change that happens by virtue of the nodes of the moon changing signs that happens every 18 months, and it's a, it points us in a direction where our eclipses are going to take place in a totally new set of signs. Uh, Whereas for the last year and a half, it's been North Node in Taurus, South Node in Scorpio. North Node future is about love and groundedness in the heart with the Taurus leading that uh, archetype and Scorpio death in the where we're like dying, uh, you know, away from the past and moving into a more grounded, loving future in eclipse consciousness for the last year and a half. And with the nodes changing signs at the end of the month, we shift the archetype that drives our sense of what's pushing us forward. And it's going to move into Aries, lots of action, startup, and movement in the next year and a half because of that. South node, the past that we're looking to move away from is Libra. So we're going to be leaving some relationship consciousness behind and we'll move sort of away from passivity Libra into action Aries. At any rate, that's a big change for the collective that happens towards the end of the month. And that alone is something worthy of like stopping and talking about, and I will. But there's an enormous interaction brewing between the nodes that change signs at the end of the month and Pluto, who's hanging out at the last degree now of Capricorn, because he retrograded back into Capricorn. And so there's this incredible T-square building at the end of the month that has an impact for the year that we're in. It also reflects changes of the last you know, decade or two and the next decade or two. I will certainly be talking all about this in my global healing meditation. That's this Thursday. You don't want to miss it because truly, while again, these couple of weeks are sort of like the last, you know, month. June was a kind of medium-ish month, and the first two weeks of July have the same energetic timbre. But trust me, the last two weeks, things start to get a little bit bumpy with Venus turning around in this tremendous T-square, which I will talk about when we get there on the podcast, but also if you... If you like my Global Healing Meditations, this week's is one you don't want to miss because this... Uh, this month is going to be epic uh, in, the, in the long run. I want to talk about Black Moon Lilith today. So if you don't know what Black Moon Lilith is, it's a point in space that's inside of the moon's orbit. So it's in between the earth and the moon that represents a kind of orientation that we all have to shadow material and unconscious stuff that we would prefer to push down below the surface that we don't want to look at, but will bubble up anyway and trip us. That sort of classic shadow. Shadow is that, you know, we don't want to pay attention to our pain, but the pain will rise up and grab our attention whether we want to or not. And that's a black moon consciousness. Sexuality is part of this. So Embracing your sexuality and healing sexual shame is a black moon Lilith consciousness. So technically, oh, because that one. 
Oh yeah. Oh, oh, honey, I'm telling you, you can look at a chart and look at some of Black Moon Lilith and its and its aspects and interpret into how they wow. operate sexually. It's it's kind of juicy. So what Black Moon is because it's inside the moon's orbit, but related to the moon's orbit, it's a point that represents something about our unconscious. So it's unconscious material that that this point reflects because it's connected to the moon and the moon is our, you know, arbiter of our unconscious in the world of astrology. But it's inside the moon's orbit, so it's got a meaning that has to do with unconscious material that's very close to us that's bubbling up. The the math behind it is it has to do with the wobble of the earth and the moon. Like I think people would imagine passively if they're not thinking more in, in more detail about this and just assume that the earth I mean the moon just sort of spins around the earth but they're dynamically interacting with each other and they pull so there's like wobble where the moon is further away and then closer and so there's this dynamic wobble between the earth and the moon and if you calculate the average of that the mean of that wobble that point from Earth's perspective is black moon Lilith. And of course, like all mathematically generated points, it has movement across the ecliptic. It stays in a sign for nine months. I love that mm -hmm. timing because we have such an association of nine months as a gestation period. Right. So I think there's something about, something powerful about this point that represents a willingness to go into the true feminine power that includes both creative and destructive impulses, because that's what the feminine power is. And in fact, I don't know why Western astrology attributed Lilith to this point to name it Black Moon Lilith. But it, but they did. And Lilith comes from the Canaanite origin story where Adam and Lilith were created by this, you know, from the same clay, therefore equal instead. And, and, and because the Canaanites were goddess worshipers as well, it was natural for them to have an origin story that cast the feminine principle in as equal strength to the masculine principle. But the patriarchy came along and discarded that, in, you know, you know, when they went to Babylon and uh, uh, the, the new, the, you know, the Old Testament was sort of codified as let's get rid of the, the goddess. Let's get rid of Lilith and let's focus on Eve, the, the origin story where the feminine principle is subservient to the masculine principle. So add this all together and you've got a point that represents shadow material that's bubbling up from the unconscious that we wish we could repress, that might have some sexual charge to it, that guides us in our integration growth process by allowing us to tap into things that are below the surface that we might otherwise shrink back from, but can dive in when... There's something happening astrologically with this point. Black Moon Lilith is in Leo right now. I love that because Venus is in Leo and Venus is going to go retrograde in Leo. Well, she's not going to hook up with Black Moon Lilith in, as part of her retrograde process because she's moving further ahead. We're in a moment where she just did connect with Black Moon Lilith, so did Mars, and now Black Moon Lilith is trining Chiron. So let me sort of break down why that's interesting and what that sort of means for us. So back on the 20th of June, Mars and Black Moon Lilith conjuncted. Mars and Leo came to where Black Moon is hanging out. And that put us through a moment where our embodiment and our action was interested in doing some deeper shadow work. I'm in the middle of my shadow class, so I, like, I can look at my landscape of my life because every time I'm teaching a class, it's going to reflect something I'm going through personally, right? So I've certainly noticed this in the last you know, week or two of my own personal shadow work. But that's the essence of Mars and Black Moon Lilith coming in together by conjunction is an activation of our embodiment and decision making that would allow us to do some deeper investigations if we were willing. 
Eight days later, Venus conjuncted Black Moon Lilith on the 28th of June. So now we have our heart centers open up to a willingness to go to deeper places below the surface to explore shadowy material, sexuality, concerns, and have some kind of a healing and an integration process, at least, if not happen, at least open up for that possibility. So what's happened now is Mars and Venus have moved forward and Mars will just keep on going. Venus will retrograde and come back to a conjunction with Black Moon Lilith on August 8th. I'll talk all about that next month. <laughs> but what we're left with this week is something powerful that's actually directly healing as opposed to what I just described in that essentially third week of June, I would call that more likely to have been triggering than healing, right? So the personal planet of Mars conjuncts Black Moon Lilith and we're open to what's going on in our embodiment with shadow and then Venus opens our hearts to that. But it's Chiron that does the healing. And so what's peaking this week is the trine between Chiron and Black Moon Lilith. That's a healing geometry. So Mars and Venus triggered us as we ended June by allowing some, some like stuff to get opened up from below the surface. And you can expect that as we move through this week, that there will be healing experiences that somehow wrap up material that might have become you might have emerged into our awareness as we were finishing up the month of June that this week will bring us experiences that allow us to say, okay, something in my experience has healed. Okay. So I know we have like a full moon coming up, but we have this black moon. Is that the same thing? Well... Yeah, that, the answer is no, you're, okay. you're mixing something up, but you're actually mixing something up that I think a lot sure. of people will mix up, especially because we just had one. A black moon and black moon Lilith are not the same thing at all. So black moon Lilith is what I just described, but black moon is just like a blue moon, right? A blue moon is two full moons in the same sign in a row or two full moons in a calendar month in a row. And a black moon is two new moons in a row in a single calendar month. Or if I, I in, my, in my book, it's about the same sign. So that, that's just a, like a, a moniker that describes repeating new moons. And black moon and black moon Lilith, which are the same thing, uh, is a point generated by the moon's movement. So we are in this interesting full moon <laughs> that has this trine between Black Moon, Lilith, and Chiron peaking in it, like, right now. So the full moon was exact in the wee hours this morning, like 4.38 a.m. Pacific time. The Capricorn moon opposed the Cancer sun, and we, if you're listening to this podcast, as it comes out, we're in it. We are in the full moon. And so before we go any deeper into the full moon's attributes, understand that one of the big kahunas in this full moon is this trine between Black Moon Lilith and Chiron. So all full moons are about release. And I certainly equate <laughs> release and healing as sort of, you know, cousins. <laughs> and so part of this full moon's power is in its capacity to help us generate a healing of whatever it, and, and if, you're, if you're sitting there going like, <laughs> of what? It's like, of what you've been working on for the last months and months and months and months. It's not like a brand new landscape. It's a deepening of the healing processes that we've been through has a real amplified opportunity in this full moon to help generate a kind of significant offload of shadow material that inhibits your ability to care for self. Like the sun's in cancer. So our conscious awareness is about what do I need 
What is going to restore me? How do I care for myself and prepare to like climb the mountain of my desires, which is good language to represent the sign of Capricorn, where the moon is. So if Capricorn teaches us that we can climb any mountain if we know the mountain we want to climb and we stay steadfast, it's in this full moon where the Cancer sun says, okay, I love your ambition, honey. <laughs> climb, climb up any mountain that you want, but make sure that you are restoring and resting and coming back to home with enough tether so that you can keep climbing that mountain. So healing possibility in this full moon, allow yourself to consider what aspects of your ambitions or your, you know, your discipline and your responsibility that pushes you out there to do, do, do. This is a full moon to say, what, what can I let go of in the doing world to honor my own sense of rest, restoration, self-care and preparation? Now, while the conjunctions from Venus and Mars to Black Moon Lilith are in our rearview mirror, in terms of the imprint of this lunation, there's still a lot of power to be received from having Mars, Venus, and Black Moon Lilith all conjunct within like six degrees of each other in Leo. That's close enough to be vibrating as one unit. So Mars at 25 Leo, Venus at 22 Leo, and Black Moon Lilith at 19 Leo allows for us to feel a kind of profound level of integration between our masculine and feminine principles and any shadow material that we need to know about where we might be, you know, leaning on one more than the other in a way that's out of balance. So Mars is about doing, Venus is about being. And when they conjunct, then we get a, a, a sort of an upgrade of our harmonizing between our being and our doing sensibilities. Now, they're not going to conjunct, right? Mars is already ahead of Venus and she's slowing down to go backwards and they didn't get to have their little, they didn't meet up and make love. <laughs> so there isn't that download that happens when they do come together. But in this full moon, the power of the lunation grabs everything that's happening in the solar system and says, you know, neon sign, this is what the energy is <laughs> that that is supporting what the full moon is allowing us to release. So in some ways, Cancer and Capricorn are very much the being doing polarity, right? Because Capricorn invented the doing at the level of climbing that mountain and achieving all your desires and being steadfastly disciplined to get her done. And cancer is always the place where we do the opposite of that and we pull back into rest and restore. So think of this full moon as a doing, being, restoration kind of reset, where if you do too much, you're going to let go of that. If you're too sort of in the restoring and rest, you know, restoration and, 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 and quietude that you can't get back out there and find your mojo of discipline, this is also your full moon. So either side of the coin allows us to release a level of our relationship to doing so that doing and being can wind up being in balance. So Mars and Venus conjunct near Black Moon Lilith is making this full moon uh, a little bit like a psychic surgery of releasing inhibitions to finding balance between your ambitions to climb the mountain and the need to rest and restore in tandem with that. So that as a result of moving through this lunar cycle, all of us are going to find ourselves better at integrating between the impulses we need to do to climb that mountain and the impulses we need to be and be in rest and restoration to keep the whole thing functioning powerfully. 
So let me let me wrap up today's astrology podcast with a tiny little. I'm not going to go into this transit in depth because it. It. I feel like if I tell you everything that Mercury's doing, everything that Mars is doing as we finish off this week, that that the data will be so complex that it won't land well for a lot of you. So I'm just going to give a tiny little overview that there's a pattern at the end of the week that plays out between like Thursday and Sunday where decisions you make have some importance to pay attention to. There's a pattern that's building between Thursday and Sunday from Mars that we call a finger of God or a finger of fate. What that is in terms of the geometry is is that it would be, in this case, Mars holding the great eliminator angle with Neptune That's on Thursday. And then a few days later, Mars, again, holding the great eliminator angle with Pluto. And what that means is Pluto and Neptune are in a loose 60 degree angle. And that creates this long, narrow triangle where the pointy end is Mars, which means the pointy end is about decisions we're making and things we choose at the end of this week between Thursday and Sunday. So it's important during those days to be discerning about where you go next and forks in the road that you come to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that that old trope, you know, take the road less traveled by, that might be a good thing to be thinking about as we move through the end of this week. But if any like forks in the road come, be mindful of the choice you make and here's why. If Neptune and Pluto are in a sextile, that's powerful. That's shadow, power, and authority and gravitas, Pluto, and our spiritual connection, Neptune, in perfect working order. That's a gorgeous energy that's just in the skies right now. It's Mars holding the great eliminator angle with Neptune is like the fog suddenly lifting, And us being able to see clearly about a choice we might need to make that in the past might have baffled us. Neptune's shadow is always cloudiness, fogginess, confusion, and I can't know where I'm going. And since Mars is all about action and going, Mars in conjuncting Neptune is very much about seeing more clearly and therefore able to move more definitively in a new direction. And then Mars doing this with Pluto allows us to offload any shadow that might have inhibited us in the past or authority issues where we had outprojected our authority and didn't own it fully. That's what can happen when Mars in conjuncts Pluto. And when you put them together like this over, you know, this is loose because it's over four or five days, it still makes the pattern that I'm describing light up. So. Mercury during those few days is doing a lot of, you know, unexpected spiritual connection, intuition, healing transits. I'm not going to outline them because we'll all lose our minds. It's too much (laughs) density. But just know the mind is active and crunchy and unexpectedly shifting during these days. And the opportunity to make a choice and have the winds of fate pick you up and push you forward with it, that's the power of a finger of God or a finger of fate. So don't make any choices in the second part of this week randomly, uh, but consider the road less traveled by as a general guidance. Look for those forks in the road and have at it. Did you know that Michael has a daily astro alert? If you enjoy hearing the weekly astrology, you might like knowing more about each day. When you subscribe for the daily astro alerts, you'll get an in-depth explanation of the day's astrology sent right to your email. Subscriptions are only $10 a month, or you can purchase the yearly subscription at the reduced price of $100. To subscribe, head over to michaelenix.com. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. 
If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaellenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. Today we have a call-in dreamer. AP is on the line. Hey, AP, what you dreaming? Hey. Yeah, so the other day uh, I woke up from a nightmare. And so I was with my grandmother and I took her to a gas station. I guess we were out for the day. And we just stopped at the gas station real quick for me to pick something up inside. So I parked the car in front of the gas station and I left her in the car. And when I come back out, the car is gone. And at this point in the dream, I'm like freaking out feeling like somebody kidnapped my grandmother. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm running yeah. you know, into the store. I'm running outside asking everybody uh, at, at the stalls, you know, have you seen this car? Somebody kidnapped my grandmother. Um, and just woke up in a sweat and terrified. Woo-hoo! Now this is, I, I, okay, I, <laughs> I love this dream. <laughs> um, of course, we wouldn't love this if it happened in your waking life. But we got to start with your grandmother. Talk to me about your grandmother, what's your relationship with your grandmother like? And what does she provide for you in your, in your day-to-day? Yeah, so she, growing up, she took care of me for some of the formative years of my mm. life. Um, and so we have a really close relationship. She's almost been like a second right. mother. And recently, it had been almost five years since I had seen her since moving to L.A. Oh, wow. And when I finally did get to see her again in November... Oh. I was just overwhelmed with how much I had missed her and how much time that I had lost. And she's now 89, has dementia. And when I left, she didn't. Um, So recently I was there again for a couple of months and really just spent every day with her working, you know, with my computer sitting next to her all day, um, as much time as I could get with her. Oh, okay. That's, that's beautiful. And of course this dream is about the resource of care that she offered you. Like, I didn't need to ask that question, AP, to know that this was the answer. (laughs) Like, I knew the answer before I asked the question because the dream tells me that. Right? So, so let's, Mm. let's break it down and let me sort of let you know why this dream tells me that. First of all, it's a nightmare. So that tells us that we're in shadow material. Like, we remember our nightmares and I have to think there's purpose to that. That when we dream of something scary that we remember when we wake up, you know, readily because it was a nightmare, it's like our unconscious saying, pay attention to this. This is important. So the theme of the dream sort of starts by like what you're doing and where you're at. The ipso facto is, and you even said this, we're out and about, right? That your language was we were out for the day. Yeah. So if you're out for the day in a dream, then you're having a dream about what it's like to be out and about in your life on a daily basis. Mm. Otherwise, the dream landscape would be very clever and give us other hints. Mm -hmm. But this is a very clear, just I'm out and about with my grandmother for the day. And so the... This sort of happens before the dream starts. The dream theme is APs in consideration of how... They move through life with their caretaking, nurturing, loving sensibility with them. Yeah, for sure. Because before it was her taking care of me. And now, and most recently when I've been spending time with her, it's been me taking care of her. Which is a beautiful thing that happens in the arc of human lives where love and care does have this beautiful trade-off. But remember, AP, this dream is your dream. It's not about anything that's happening. Well, it can be about things that are happening with your grandmother in the outside world. I want you to get that what I'm talking about in this first part of the dream where you're driving with your grandmother, I want you to think of your grandmother in the dream as part of you. The part of you. Ooh, no. <laughs> Getting a little emotional. The part of you that learned how to love yourself. Because someone outside of you loved you. Mm. 
And now I'm getting emotional. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so what's a gas station? It's a place where we stop and rest and refuel so we can continue going. So I'm already then seeing a theme building of the caretaking, loving, nurturing function of grandmother archetype. And while this isn't as nurturing and feminine, it's still important that without gas, we can't go. So both of those things are needed to, to, to move forward in life is, you know, nurturing, sustaining care and fuel to get where we want to go next. So it's fascinating to me that you are in your waking life really grappling with her mortality. Yes, for sure. And she's been so supportive of of my transition and more so than, you know, some of the younger folks. So (laughs) thinking about her leaving us has been hard. Wow, AP. (laughs) Now that's a little piece of extra information that makes it even more powerful that your psyche is wanting you to tap into understanding the importance of this relationship and the importance of the process of separating. In fact, what you're doing by spending more time deliberately uh, with her to sort of cultivate a greater connection before she passes is that you're doing that by behaving, you know, putting behavioral energy into being with her and hanging out. And the dream is kind of showing you the snapshot of the freak out that's going on as well. Because if you don't process the fear and the grief, you you won't be able to integrate and move forward. So this dream is just a little gift (laughs) from your psyche saying, hey, AP, I just want you to know we're also in some pain, some frightened, you know, perspective. We're freaking out a little bit about this pending loss. And the dream itself then helps you in the process of integrating the difficult experience that is also very beautiful that you're moving through with her right now. Yeah, I'm definitely, Mm. definitely frightened of her loss. I, I understand. I understand. And uh, um, how are you, how do you orient with the idea that she may be easily connectable when she passes? I think um, that would give me some relief to know that I would still feel connected to her. Is this your first big loss? Um, Of someone that I'm this close to? Okay. First or second, my grandfather okay. was also close to, but not the way, not the way I'm close to her. I suspect that you're going to feel great connections with her uh, in, in your heart after, after she passes. Um, but part of that is, is that you're a person who has enough respect for the unconscious and the edges of, you know, uh, 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 the mildly spiritual sensibilities like dreams have meaning and you call into a, a, sh- a show to, to talk about it. <laughs> and my hope, of course, is that you have significant dream connections with her when she passes, because that's one of the ways in which we do feel deeply connected to loved ones when they pass. And I've, I've heard countless stories of people whose soulful perspective about life changed because they lost somebody deeply <laughs> and felt that unmistakable sense of connection. And it's going to suck, AP. Grief is awful. Yeah. It's painful. <laughs> it's difficult. And I'm just letting you know that your whole psyche is engaged in helping. And so a nightmare like this might be something that you could say, oh, I wish that hadn't happened. It was uncomfortable and scary. I'm letting you know that it 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 is as important a part of your separation process and the pending grief to have scary dreams of the freak out as it is to sit next to her lovingly and feel her presence in her body while you still can. Yeah, it felt very, very real, Mm. the dream. And even thinking back to it, it causes pain just even thinking about the dream. So it definitely makes a lot of sense that this is like something that I'm anticipating and in fear of. And your soul will carry you through. And resilience will carry you through. And uh, and thank you so, 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 so much for sharing your vulnerability with me and Zoe and, and the thousands of people who are listening. 
<laughs> Thank ah, you for the insight. Happy. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.